Taylor, why don't you take it away? All righty. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 25th virtual shadowing session. My name is Taylor, and tonight we have for you a specialty spotlight in clinical pediatrics with Dr. Carrie Dutton. Next slide, please. Um, as always, we have our working group of consisting of Rachel, Reagan, Shayan, Ani, myself, Miriam, Rohit, Alana, um, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marchetti, and Dr. Salazar. And then Dr. Fowler, you had something to say? We just wanna welcome everybody. You know, we're over six months into this and it's just an absolute honor to continue to present this to you. Uh, this, this is something we dreamed up a little over six months ago. And now as of this afternoon, there were 32,000 people that have signed up on our website. Clearly, we've touched on to something that's important to a, a lot of people who are seeking out a medical education. So just to say again, that as long as you keep coming, we're gonna be here and we're just absolutely delighted tonight to welcome a very special guest that you're gonna thoroughly enjoy. And so um, let's have our other special person, Rachel, why don't you take it away? Hi, um, can you go to the next slide, Dr. K? Um, be sure to tune in the upcoming weeks for our other uh, sessions. We have especially spotlight in emergency medicine following this week after it's a PA spot, uh, especially spotlight. Um, and then we have path to being a nurse with a nurse practitioner. So be sure to join us on zoom or YouTube live those days. Uh, next, oh, next slide, please. <laughs> And if you have any questions, please put it in the chat. The working group and I will be collecting all the questions to ask to Dr. Dutton during the two designated Q&A sessions. Um, please leave all questions about the assessment till the very end. We will talk about that at the very end. Um, and then next slide. Tonight we have Dr. Carrie Dutton. Uh, she is one of my great mentors. I've shadowed her personally. She is a ball of sunshine. She's helped me through my pre-medical journey through the rough times. And she's really inspired me to be a great caring provider. She really takes the time to care for every person's heart, body, and soul. And I'm really excited for you guys to meet her. So without further ado, Dr. Dutton. Hello, it's great to be here tonight with all of you. And um, I guess I need to mention where I did my training. Undergraduate, I went to Baylor University in Waco, Sikkim Bears. Um, I did medical school at University of um, U UT in Houston. So I guess it's the University of Texas Health Science Center Medical School of Houston. And then my residency at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital in Nashville. And I absolutely loved all three. Loved my four years at Baylor. The Houston Medical Center was so exciting with like seven different hospitals and two medical schools and a dental school, so much going on, MD Anderson, all the research, uh, and left my time at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital as all of the six states, I think, that surround Tennessee would, would uh, kind of send their worst cases to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. So I got to see uh, a lot of different things. I wanna um, just kind of start this off with um, this uh, young man who's now 20 years old and he's a football player uh, in Northern Colorado University. I started taking care of him when he was six months old. And every time I run into this family, the, the mom's first comment is uh, that, that this is, I saved her son's life twice. So I just wanted to tell a couple stories. When uh, he was about two and three quarters years old, um, he uh, had woken up with a little bit of cough in the morning, a little bit of a hoarse voice, and then went down for a nap, and then evidently woke up from his nap, literally couldn't breathe. Mom threw him, six-month-old sister, in the car, uh, drove straight to our office without calling, just busted through the door, frightened to death. Uh, so I called all my staff as I followed mom in, and uh, Brooks, again, was two and three quarters, and he was in the what we call air-hungry so he's leaning forward, hands on his knees, his neck is up, trying to get breath and there's tears running down his cheeks because he can feel like he's about to suffocate to death. So he was having a sudden episode of croup and that's how sudden and severe it can be. So I had yelled to my staff. And so I look at my front desk and I said, call 911 and get the ambulance to come. I looked at one of my nurses and I said, pull up some sub epi. I looked at the other nurse and I said, get an albuterol breathing treatment ready. I uh, said, get the other doctor. So Dr. Steve walked in. I said, you need to get the crash cart down uh, from, from, we had it up in a high closet. And then literally I reached over and put my hands in the middle of Brooks's chest. And I just said, God, I'm asking you 
to relax his airway and to allow the oxygen to flow freely until the rest of this medical care can, can set into place. The ambulance arrived. I had a busy afternoon of patients. Uh, literally, mom had to leave the six-month-old with us. She calls her husband at work. We're like, we're, we'll watch her. You go in the ambulance with him. Your husband can come here, get the baby when he has a chance. Three hours later, the ER calls and they're like, hey, Dr. Dutton, he is toddling around the ER, drinking juice and eating Cheetos. We think he's ready to go. So the, the breathing treatments, and I think we had probably given him a dose of steroids, uh, had all kicked in, the airway calmed down, and there you have. You got through what looked like a what, definitely the scariest outpatient group I've seen. Uh, and then when he was five years old, he was in for his checkup and I noticed one pupil was uneven, a different size than the other. And I couldn't tell if it was kind of moving as well or not. And I looked at the mom and she's got three kids. So I know her well. And I said, you know, a lot of people have asymmetric pupils. It can be like a birthmark, like a mole or it mean nothing. Literally it can mean nothing. I, I've sent lots of kids to the eye doctor. It means nothing. And I said, but in his case, I didn't ever, I didn't have that down at his two-year checkup. I didn't have down at his three-year checkup. I didn't mark it down at his four-year checkup that I noticed an unevenness in his pupil size. Um, so I think we need to see the pediatric ophthalmologist. Well, it turns out that he was having severe uveitis as the first initial sign of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And he had already lost vision like 40% vision in his right eye by the time we ever got him to pediatric ophthalmologist. He ended up on methotrexate. So we got ahead of any joint uh, damage. Therefore, he's a hugely healthy football player. Um, but those are the kind of things that remind you that there's a lot of routine in pediatrics, but you need to be ready uh, when the emergencies are coming in the door. And, and he was certainly one of, the, one of those that reminded us of that. A, a very cute story that I embarrassed Brooks with is when he came in for his four-year checkup, um, he says to me at the end of the visit, Dr. Dutton, I love you just the way that I am. <laughs> Not the way that you are. I love you just the way that I am. And the mom's like, we're trying to teach him unconditional love, but he hasn't quite got that. Since <laughs> I love you just the way I am. Um, so anyway, one of those um, just cute stories in, in pediatrics. Um, when I was getting ready for this conversation, I found myself more and more wanting to encourage medical students, regardless of what field you go into. Like my heart was a little less pediatrics and a little more just everyone heading into the pre-health, whatever, pre-medicine, pre-dental, you may have OT, PT, I don't know what all kinds of students watch this. But I just wanted to give you some perspective that I wish I had when I was going through it. First of all, if you can stay fascinated and intrigued while you're going through medicine, medical training, it can cause so much of the stress and the exhaustion to come off of you. And what I mean by that is the, as far as I'm concerned, the human body is the most complicated, integrated system, computer system that's ever existed. And I mean that with all of my heart. The miracle of the human body is that it works as well as it does, as often as it does. And I, so if you can just go into that next load that you're trying to learn and remind yourself, I need to just stay fascinated and intrigued about this system, the liver that we're learning or the, the, the brain. Number two, there are going to be many, many times that you feel overwhelmed in medicine. But what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to allow overwhelmed to equal inadequate. Overwhelmed is because you're trying to learn an enormous amount of information about this amazing, fascinating, complex system. It's not because you're inadequate. And so sometimes you, you might even have to practice that sentence. You may need to walk out of class or off of the cadaver, or you may literally need to walk to your car and go, feeling overwhelmed does not mean I'm inadequate. Feeling overwhelmed does not mean I'm inadequate. If you are somebody that struggles with grades, if, if, if trying to keep your grades up pre-med has already been a beat down for you, then you, you, you have to start medical training with uh, a, some type of sentence that can encourage your heart. And that's a good one. Feeling overwhelmed does not mean I'm inadequate. Um, number three, demand to understand. 
medical school and residency, that's your chance to learn. Their job is to teach you. So there are no silly questions. And there's no interruptions in class if you're not understanding what's being taught. I had a reputation. I mean, my arm was the first one up in the class. I, in, it could be a class of 400. And I would like, I'm sorry, could you say that again? Could you explain that in some other way? Or I could be in a 25 people in a residency group. And the same, for me, if I understand something, I will remember it. If I understood how that functioned or how that worked or how that protein, then it's there, it's in my mind. I, I am not good with rote memorization. I need to understand and then it sticks. And I, I can't tell you how many people walked up to me after lectures, after residency groups and said, thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for stopping them and asking them to explain it again. Because so many, if you are confused, if you're not getting it, there's probably a hundred other people that are confused and not getting it. And you know what? It's your right to demand to understand in medical school. <laughs> That's their job. Um, complexity, the complexity of the human body does require perseverance. Think about it. There are scientists that spend their entire life studying the brain. There are scientists that spend their entire life studying the endocrine system. Somebody else spends their entire career on the heart muscle. Somebody else, their entire career, uh, ear, nose, throat. And you're trying to learn the basics of that whole system. So again, it, there just is a lot. <laughs> There's just a lot to absorb. And, and if you can go back to part number one, and just go, okay, I've got to persevere because the system is so complex. But if I can stay fascinated and intrigued about the fact that I am studying the most complex integrated computer system that ever existed, that can help you. Specialty pearls. I don't know if every residency do, does this, but in, at my residency, every other Friday at noon, the specialists came and talked to us pediatric neurologist, pediatric pulmonologist, the geneticist, the oncologist, the endocrine. So we had an hour lunch um, specialty. And, you know, sometimes it was hard to stay. You're tired. You might've been up the entire night before, but it, I cannot tell you how many times a sentence or two from a specialist during those times. And, and I finished residency in 1993. So 27 years ago. So I'm talking a long time ago. And I just want to, a couple of them. My very first year out in practice, um, I was seeing a three-year-old. The parents saw a family medicine doctor and they took the son to a family medicine doctor. And about four weeks before, he had just started complaining that his legs hurt a lot. And they took him to the doctor like two weeks. And the, the doctor's like, you know, it's probably just growing pains. He's probably about to get taller or he just grew. And, and exactly, that's probably exactly what I would have done on the first visit. They take him back a week later because now he's he's complaining more and he's limping and he's not getting up and playing as much. And they take him back to the family doctor and he does x-rays of the hips and knees and they're fine. X-rays look fine. So tells the tells the parents, you know, x-rays look great. Doesn't look like anything concerning. Then the parents bring him to me as a pediatrician. And now we're four or five weeks into this. And I, I literally could remember sitting in class in residency hearing the pediatric oncologist tell us that in eight to 12% of pediatric cancers, the presenting sign is bone pain. So I got a CBC, I got blood work that day. Um, it didn't come back till the end of the day. It was like 515 when it finally came off the printer and my heart just sunk. The white count was off that year was like 28,000. The platelets were down, the, he was anemic the blasts were filling. It was, it was leukemia. I was looking at a white, it just, I called the oncologist at the children's hospital, nearest children's hospital. And I'm like, okay, so the, I'm, I'm assuming these parents need to head there first thing tomorrow morning. And he's like, no, you need to call the parents. They need to get three days of clothes ready and they need to come tonight. I, my fellow will be waiting for them. We need to go ahead and get a central line in and treatment must start immediately. And, and it was like, wow. So that was, that was a specialty pearl. Um, a second one, pediatric neurologist. I remember one of the neurologists trying to help us understand 
when the need of a lumbar, a spinal tap, lumbar puncture, and when not. And um, uh, toddlers have uh, something called febrile seizures. If they have sudden onset of very high fever, that it can trigger a seizure. But after 10, 15 minutes, the temperature starts to come back down, the body kind of resets and they perk up. And all of a sudden they're asking for juice or they're wanting to walk down the hall of the, of the office or the emergency room. And um, I just remember the neurologist saying seizures, if it's meningitis, if it's the most serious thing, an infection around the brain, seizures are a very late ominous sign of, of uh, meningitis. So if you have a, a kid, even with a high fever and with a seizure, but they perked up with, within 15, 20 minutes, they're walking around the room asking for something to eat, then they do not need a spinal tap. This is not meningitis. So that has saved me a lot of worry uh, through the years. Um, and to understand febrile seizures as a, as a fairly common uh, thing in pediatrics that happens. And then this next picture, and then we'll come back to the rest of this slide. This is the little guy, this is his three year checkup, but uh, I saw him when he was three days old. And then uh, we had scheduled him at 10 days old for me to do a circumcision uh, in the office and combine that with kind of the two week check that we normally do. Uh, I can't remember why they didn't circumcise him in the hospital, but anyway, so I'm seeing him at 10 days and I'm checking him out first and I hear a heart murmur, a fairly loud one. Um, Murmurs are more common than people think in the newborn period because lots of lots of shifting in the heart. You know, the the mom's body's been doing all the job and sending all the oxygen. All of a sudden, things shift in the in the heart. We can hear murmurs that come and go. Um, and the baby was pink, looked great, eating. I think already at ten days was back above birth weight. Um, but the thing at his three day check and the thing that mattered here is he had six fingers, so he had an extra pinky finger. Uh, one of them actually had a little bit of bone and the orthopedics, I think, removed that when he was one. Uh, the other side was just a big nub of skin. And I just actually tied a, a, a suture and just tied it as tight as I could. It fell off four days later. Um, but I could, rem when I was looking, listening to his heart murmur, looking at him at 10 days old, I'm looking at the extra digits on his fingers and I can literally hear the geneticist talking in re residency. Whenever a child has a major congenital malformation or congenital defect, there's a much higher chance that they have a, a second one. So just having some abnormality gives them a much greater chance of having another abnormality. So I just looked at the parents. I said, you know what? This is probably nothing. And a lot of newborns have murmurs, but because of the extra fingers, it, it might be something more serious. And so I'm going to just get you to the pediatric cardiologist, let them do an echo. If they okay, we'll do the circumcision or I'll get you to the urologist, whatever. So that was like a Tuesday afternoon. We were able to get them quickly to the pediatric cardiologist, I think on Thursday. Um, and on Friday morning, I get to the office and I call the mom just because the car, nobody had called Thursday afternoon. So I just want to make sure they had gotten in, the visit went well. And, and the mom says, hey, uh, I said, how did the visit go yesterday? And she said, it went fine. We're, we're at the hospital. He's going to have open heart surgery this afternoon. And I'm like, excuse me? And she said, yeah, he had a major interrupted aortic arch. An area of his aorta wasn't formed. And in fact, the cardiothoracic surgeon told me to say, well done, pediatrician. This is usually not picked up until six to 12 months of age. And they usually have damage to their heart by then. And so again, it was a pediatric curl of just the geneticist saying that thought, if they have one congenital defect or anomaly, malformation, there's a much increased risk compared to the rest of the population of another one. And um, I just, I, I guess I want to encourage you <laughs> to pay attention to the specialists when they come and do their talks to you. And I, and I, if you're bold enough, again, I wish I could impart to you the boldness to ask questions. Um, if you were bold enough at the end of the talks to be the one that raises their hand and said, okay, if there were two things you wanted a general pediatrician to know from your talk today, what are those? If you're not that bold, maybe wait till the class goes away and go up to the professor, or go up to the physician, the specialist yourself, and just say that. I think I'm going to be a general pediatrician. What would be the two things you would want me to know? 
um, because it can make a, a huge difference. And I was telling um, Taylor and Rachel, I guess, when we were talking about this, I, I could give you 15 examples if I had time. So I, I, I just you know, wanted to share with you the leukemia, wanted to share with you uh, the, the um, um, what did, which ones did I, oh, the leukemia and then uh, the febrile seizures and not needing spinal taps and um, this little guy with an interrupted aortic arch who's absolutely fabulous. I just saw him for his seven year well check and now he's got a three-year-old brother. Um, so I'm gonna go back up to the slide. Grades or board scores? My goodness, something that absolutely is overwhelming your mind and causing you so much distress. MCAT, GPA, board scores when you get into medicine. I, I'm going to tell you today, in 28 years of pediatrics, thousands of patient visits, 900 patient families, I have never once, not once, had a patient family ask me, what I made on my MCAT or how I did on my boards. I've had them ask me, would you do it again? How intense was training? What's the hardest case you ever saw? But never in, never about scores, never about. And so if I, if I could just give you that perspective, I know it's important. I know it seems to matter so much right now, but it's someday it's not gonna matter at all if that helps to take just a little bit of the pressure. It's, it is not a reflection. Let me restate that. Your GPA, your MCAT score, and eventually your board scores probably have very little to do with how great of a physician you're going to be. So take the weight off of yourself. Do what you need to do to get to where you want to go, but don't, don't, don't be walking around with a backpack of rocks on your shoulders about your MCAT or about, it, it's not, it, it's, un, it's so unnecessary, so unnecessary. I'm sorry, let me dip, my voice is a little dry. Thorough versus efficient. Medical training is a time that you are given more time to do exams because you're not supposed to be able to know how to do them quickly yet. It, so you, you get to take your time. Please take your time. Please take your time and learn what a spleen feels like and learn what a liver feels like and learn, learn what uh, abnormal abnormalities are like. Um, my second year in residency, um, we did rotations at the general hospital in Nashville, Nashville General Hospital. I think it's Meharry now, but anyway, um, and it was limited. <laughs> you might be a, your second year of residency and you might be the top resident there. <laughs> So um, it was being a, a bit about thrown in the deep end at times. Um, but we had a little, um, I think he was somewhere between four and six months. It's been a long time now. Um, but he wasn't gaining weight and he was kind of having a low grade fever that was going along a long time. And so it was like, we had seen him a couple of times in clinic. We're like, we need to admit this little one, figure out what's going on. So we need to admit him to, to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And um, so the attending had, had seen the guy and quickly done an exam. And the upper level resident had done an exam and I was the third one. And then, I, so I call the attending and I'm like, what, like, what's up with that? Like hard mass in the bottom of the abdomen. And, and she's like, what? I said, well, I, I felt a kind of like a hard mass in, in the lower abdomen. And she's like, Catherine. So put a urinary cath and literally four times the amount of urine that he should be able to hold at that age came out. And it ended up being the answer. Um, he, he had what we call posterior urethral valves. So the valves of the urethra that go from the kidneys down into the bladder uh, were malformed and they weren't, the urine wasn't all going in the right direction. And it can cause just a mouth. If it's not caught by about six months of age, they can go into kidney failure with posterior urethral valves. So that is one of those times that literally my taking my time slowly to do the full exam and then go, okay, this doesn't feel right. Something else is going on. And so I just encourage you, um, you'll have lots of years in whatever you choose to go into to become efficient if you need to. You'll have many, many years to get your own rhythm down You'll, you will have seen a lot of cases and you'll know what to be concerned about, what not to. You'll have a street sense 
um, once you've been into whatever specialty you pick, that you have a lot of those years. Medical school and residency really is your time to get a thorough understanding of all the different ways a liver and a spleen can look and all the different ways eardrums look and throats look and tonsils look and what's, what's the scope of, of the vast range of normal. And so I encourage you to do that. And um, finally, I just wanted to say um, who you are going into medical school or dental school or pre, pre-health. I, I'm not, again, I'm not sure all the audience here, what all things you're going into, OT, PT, um, but who you are matters. So it's really important that you don't lose your passions and your gifts and your talents in medical training of, you know, if you love to play tennis, if you love to go on hikes, if you're a musician and you play an instrument, you need to keep doing that through medical school. You need to keep you intact. Uh, I remember at the end of my first year in medical school, um, hearing someone say, never let the urgent overcome what's truly important. And I thought about that a thousand times. Never let the urgent, medical school is always going to be urgent. Medical training is always going to seem urgent, but there are other important things in your life, whether that's your closest relationships, whether it's other gifts and talents that you enjoy doing, those need to survive medical school. Those those need to survive your medical training. Uh, And you're going to have to be, you know, sometimes kind of fierce about that. Sometimes you just have to put the book aside and go, you know what, I may not be ready but I've spent hours upon hours studying this pathology this weekend and I'm going to go play tennis or I'm going to go to a movie or I'm going to go call a friend or whatever it is. Yeah, um, but don't lose you. Don't lose you in medical training because then the physician you are is so narrow compared to the enlarged person that you could be in medical training. And I, I want to, I'm, I'm a person of, of, of um, deep faith and I, I just want to say a couple things about how I held on to that. Um, in medical school, I made sure I just stayed fascinated over the one that created all of this. So every marvelous system I learned about, I'm like, wow, God, you created the human heart. Like when, when I was in medical school, they just discovered atrial natriuretic factor, ATN. So it's like, how much fluid your atrium, the top part of your heart, how much fluid is it? How much blood is in there at a time? That has to do with blood volume in the body that can affect blood pressure. And they had, somebody had just discovered this hormone that this place in your heart, this upper chamber of your heart created or put into the bloodstream that could be a sign of blood pressure. I don't know where that went. That's an adult medicine thing. I probably should have looked it up before I brought it up, but I, I can just remember detail after detail after detail to be able to go, you, God, are amazing. This is remarkable. This human body is rem- This is unbelievable. Um, and, and so to just, you know, stay on the things that matter to you. And then when I was in residency, we did a, a month in normal, new, normal nursery, a month of normal nursery. All you did for an entire month was examine newborn babies. And in the big hospitals, there's a whole lot of babies, you know, 15, 20 a day. So you're just learning to, you know, listen into hearts and learning to do the hip check and the newborn and learning to talk to moms and learn to talk about breastfeeding and just all kinds of things that you are going to need to, to know how to do. Um, and I remember on my second or third day in the normal nursery, just hearing God say to me, Carrie, don't ever take for granted that you're one of the first humans to put your hands on this baby. And I began back then 30, 28 years ago, when I'm listening to the heart of a newborn in the newborn nursery, I'm like, God, I pray that this heart will come to know you as he grows up. When I'm looking at the red reflex in the eyes, I pray that these eyes will come to see you, God, as this baby grows up. I just started blessing in the newborn nursery. And that turned into the pattern of well checks, every, every single well check. I mean, my gosh, probably done 7,000 well checks would be my guess, something like that. I end every single well check with a prayer. And I ask the parents if they're over three years old, what do you enjoy or appreciate most about James? What do you enjoy or appreciate most about Sarah? And they might go, oh, she's so kind hearted or he's so generous. He buys a toy for his baby brother. Anytime he can buy something for him. And I just bless him. God, I thank you for James. I thank you for his life. I thank you for giving James to his family as a gift and a treasure. I thank you for a generous heart that already wants to give. And I ask that you preserve that in his life. God, let him know that you're generous towards him. And I, I just press in to speak a blessing at Well Checks. And if I've seen them since a newborn, that's the two-week check, two-month, 
four months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, 24. So I've, I've prayed over this maybe seven times in the first two years of life. If I've done every well check and that's a pattern that started in residency. All I'm saying is you feel like you're just gutting through medical training, but you're not just gutting through, uh, hold on to who you are in medical training. And it was an expand, hold, hold on to the gifts and passions and talents of who you are when you start medical training. You know, if you have close friends, just ask them to guard that for you and, and ask you about it. When, when's the last time you played that instrument? When's the last time you played tennis with a friend? When's the last time you, you got out on the mountain bike, if that's what you left to do. So sometimes other people need to help guard that for you. All right, primary care in general. A, a lot of residency is people figuring out, do I wanna do a primary care or do I wanna be a specialist? Um, and it was kind of actually obvious. So those that dreaded going to their continuity clinic that thought that was boring versus those of us that could not wait to get to our continuity clinic where you got to actually see the same patients and got to establish relationship. But if you're thinking about primary care, you really do need to value or believe that the general health maintenance, that's what they talk, call it on the adult side, well child check is what we call it in pediatrics. You really do have to have a sense that that's in, as important as disease or illness. Like talking to the adults about their blood pressure, about their diet, uh, how their career is going, family history of early illnesses, and talking through with moms, the development and growth on the, and, and different things like that. If that never seems as important to you, I'm not sure you're going to be content and happy in primary care because you're seeing, you know, in the summer, probably 75% of my visits are well child check or sports check. And only 25% are illness in the winter that flips in the November, December, January, February, 75% of my visits are illness related. And, and we limit the number of well checks in order to have more space, but that that's a big part of primary care. And I just want you to think about that going into it. Do, do I value health maintenance as much as disease? Um, second, embracing private life questions. Uh, Again, I'm in a practice with two family doctors and two pediatricians. So um, on the, the family practice side, literally they have four generations. <laughs> so a couple of the doctors literally have great grandparents, grandparents, parents, and little ones. So, um, you know, there's 90 year olds walking slowly down the hall sometimes when I've got a mom bringing in a newborn. Um, and so on the adult side, Let's say it's a 60 year old that, that, that the practice is taken care of for 20, 25 years. They, so they know, they know this, um, you know, it might be the adult doctor. What, remind me what you're doing career wise. How many years have you been doing that? Do, do you still enjoy doing that? Are you glad that's what you chose? And then remind me how long you've been married. Okay. You and your wife have been married 30 years. Wow. Congratulations. Do you still like her? <laughs> Are there things that you still enjoy doing together? Are you still having sex? Uh, just those, you know, private life questions are, are a part of primary care. Um, on the pediatric side, I had just very recently one come up, a patient with three, three kids. So I know the mom pretty well. And she had brought two of them in for a well check. And then I saw that the third was on for next week. And in these last couple months, thank you. In these last couple months, I've been um, asking, you know, how did the, how did, life go with the coronavirus. Like all of a sudden when everybody was home, middle of May, middle of March, middle of May. And this mom just laughingly said, it was night. It was a nightmare for our family. My, my husband was home. I'm trying to teach three different grades of kids. I'm trying to keep the kids quiet. And, and she just said, yeah, I think I probably personally kept open the closest liquor store to our house. Just very casually, very humorously. But you know, I stuck that in the back of my mind and I thought when she's in next week, I'm going to ask about that. So when she was back in the next week with the third one for their well check, I asked my nurse to come in the room and watch the kids. And I took mom to a different room and I, I just said, you know what, how are things now for your family? And she said, no, we're finding our rhythm again after coronavirus. We're, we figured out kind of how things are going. And I said, well, let me just ask you a really direct question. Are either you or your husband still drinking alcohol every day? And she said, no, we are not. But thank you for being willing to ask me that question. And I said, well, in crisis, people, 
you know, they head towards crutches and sometimes they never get away from those crutches. And so um, anyway, that's in, in primary care, private life, life questions or something that you would need to be willing uh, to ask. Also primary care connection to people more than processes. You really do begin loving to be in the season of the family's life. For pediatrics, you know, wow, I got to see them when they were three days old. Now they're in for their kindergarten well check and they're singing the ABC song to me. Uh, and then I might be seeing them as a teenager and, and asking about sexual activity and boyfriends and girlfriends and things like that. Uh, and then the last point, cultivate critical thinking. If I had to give you like the most beneficial, I guess is the right word, the most beneficial summary I could think of, it would be this. When you're seeing a, a someone with symptoms, if you begin cultivating the thought process, what are the two most common things this represents and the one most serious? These, the, the, the fever, the muscle aches, the cough or whatever I might be seeing, what are the two most common things this probably represents and what, what would be the one most serious it might? And as you begin thinking about that or even thinking about that in medical school and residency, I, th I think it'll really uh, make, make a difference in, um, in just putting things together uh, in your mind. Pediatrics and specifics. Okay, what keeps it interesting? For me, um, what keeps it most interesting is the different age groups. So a newborn versus a one-year-old versus a five-year-old versus a 15-year-old, both the growth and development, the uh, potential injury to them in life, the, the illnesses that affect them are completely different. Uh, the, what is most common, commonly causing a 12-month-old high fever is completely different than what would most commonly be, be causing a 15-year-old high fever. So just that on any given day, I very well could have a three-day-old newborn, followed by an 18-month well check, followed by you know a 10-year-old with strep, followed by counseling a 15-year-old with anxiety. Um, the age groups really keep pediatrics interesting. That that both illness and wellness, um, just getting to have a very uh, different span of ages and, and knowing that the, the stressors of life, the potential dangers for each age group, whether that's illnesses or injury or different things like that, is completely different in the different age groups. So I, I feel like I'm getting such an, a, an amazing mix most of the time. Um, two patients at a time. <laughs> so I, I'm getting to connect to the little one. And, and I have purposefully in my practice as a pediatrician, I literally talk to the, the, to the little one first. When I walk in a room, if a mom's holding a six month old, I look and I go, hi, Peter, how are you? And then, hello, Mrs. Jones, how are you today? And if they're three years old, if they're 15 years old, I address the, the pediatric patient first because I want to remind them that I'm there for them. Um, and then of course the communication and the education is with the parent that brought them in or both parents that brought them in or a grandparent that brought them in. Um, and, and so that also I think keeps things interesting is that you're having a dynamic of, of really operating with a couple different patients at a time. A big part of, of pediatrics for me is what I call being a cheerleader for the parents. And what I mean by that is I think we have too much information out there. I think, you know, how to raise the perfect child, what to expect when you're expecting and what to this. I, I literally have told patient families, I'm asking you to not read anything for the next three months and just enjoy your child. Just enjoy the specific personality your child has. Parents are trying to do things perfectly and there's no perfect because the parent is different and the child is different. So every pairing, Every pairing is unique and different from every other pairing. And, and so there's, there's just really no encouragement. Uh, I mean, there's no comparison and parents need to be encouraged to look at and, been, and to be given space to just find out what works for their family, to find out what works. And, and parents are dismayed a lot of times at how different the personality of their kids are. They're like, okay, my, my husband and I are the same that have these three kids, how could they possibly be so different? Um, and talking through things like that and, and, and helping sometimes a parent really connects well with one child 
Maybe that child has the same interest as the parent. Maybe it's a sports child. The other one's an artist. Neither of the parents is creative or they're like, I mean, we don't even know what to do with her art skills and we can't ever get her outside to play soccer with us. So uh, pediatrics, you know, not only is it growth and development, not only is it the intermittent illnesses that they have, intermittently serious things that come up, but a lot of parents, a lot of pediatrics is trying to help parents relax relax into being parents and learn to enjoy this instead of be stressed out about it um, so much of the time. Now, the overuse of antibiotics is a major issue in every segment of medicine. And years ago, I, I believe I actually wrote the, I've updated them about every five years, but, but I think in my very first year of practice, if I'm remembering correctly, I went ahead and began typing up handouts that I send the parent home with. You can see fever, handout on fever, common cold, vomiting and diarrhea, ear infection. I think I have eight different ones, bronchiolitis, this. And um, so I can be talking to a parent and say, you know, 80% of the time, fever in the range of a 101 to 104 in your child's age group is just a virus. It's a routine viral illness. Their immune system takes care of it. Uh, I don't see an ear infection. I don't see strep. I don't hear anything in these lungs that sounds like pneumonia. I don't see anything after exam that I think an antibiotic would help. And the parents, you know, they have to trust you when their kid has 103.2 fever and you're not going to send them home. And, um, but I, I have found that education and using these handouts buys me that right um, to, to use antibiotics um, appropriately and not overuse them uh, as much as I can. Um, trusting follow-up. One of the things that I think in, in medical school and residency that's hard for you to relate to um, because you kind of have to, you have to have the answer that day. And so you do a lot of extra tests. But when you get out into private practice and you have families that you know and that you trust, it makes all the difference in the world. I, I in a, On a winter day when it's flu season, when it's RSV season, I might see five kids literally with fevers of 102 to 105. And maybe one of them I thought about later in the night. Maybe maybe one later in the evening, I was like, gosh, wonder if that was early pneumonia. Wonder if this is you know early meningitis. I wonder if a kidney infection is forming. So the moment I get to the office in the morning, I have my nurse, I said, could you call? Uh, you know, Sherry's mom and find out how the night went and what the fever curve. And if, and, and if it's still rough, I have them come back in the next day. And just the ability to see pediatrics or to see the patients, I also helps you to not overuse antibiotics. If you trust the parent, we'll bring them back in so that you can take another look at the little one and um, determine, you know, whether there's a concern or whether I need to do blood work the second day. Um, and so follow-up is a great part of private practice. It, it, I don't think I had any sense how wonderful that would be uh, in medical training, but once you get out, it's wonderful. So what, now I'm going to um, begin a video. So we, we had somebody actually come to my practice and video a four-month well check, uh, because after Rachel had shadowed me for several months, she's like, you know what, I think it would be helpful to, to see someone in, actually in action. So I'm hoping I can just go to the next here and yes, okay. And I think this is about four minutes long. Good morning. How are you? Look how big you've gotten. Oh, he must be like in six to nine months close. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I think he skipped his size. <laughs> yeah, he did actually. I mean, his growth chart shows us he does. He did skip a size indeed. So you're still breastfeeding, yep. and how often is he wanting to do that? Um, every three hours. So okay. Mm -hmm. And does he give you any longer stretch consistently like, at um, night? Yeah, like four to four to nine hours. Oh, so very sporadic. Yeah. Okay. We've we've uh, gotten more. Okay. Like longer. Okay. Recently, but I mean, though he doesn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. Like nutritionally, between four and five months, they can go a steady eight to nine hours shift. Okay. So we just have to help him yeah, know that that's true. He can get all the calories he needs in during the daytime yeah. hours at four months. Though he may not be convinced about that. And, you know, so far he's had this past week. He's had longer. Okay. He's had longer stretches finally. Okay, so longer stretches lately. So that's good news. And as far as different things that he's doing, smiling at you guys, cooing at you guys, making some sounds, 
Growlings. Oh. Growlings. <laughs> Did the brothers teach him that? I don't know. Okay. Uh, and if you're holding stuff. <laughs> okay, if you're holding him and the other brothers are running around or doors running around, do you see him tracking yeah. okay. or will he, with his eyes? And will he even turn his head? Yes. To follow them now. Yeah. But, okay, great. But sometimes not because it's so much. I think sometimes it's so much that he just Stay still so that he can quiet himself. Yeah. It like bringing his hands to his mouth. Uh -huh. Like go back to that right now. Okay. Has he discovered his toes yet? He just did this past week to hold him. Okay. Hold so him. he okay. Not in the mouth yet. <laughs> and have you noticed like that he seems to focus on the ceiling fan or a favorite painting? Yeah. He, he's done that for a little bit. His, the, the, they seem to love the ceiling fan. Yeah, the fan, and then there's one thing in our in our bedroom okay. that he likes. And is he still uh, sleeping in a bassinet in your room? He is, yes. yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a... Yeah, for his safety in, yeah. in your... Mother, the new baby. And are the older kids in the co-op now? Mm -hmm. So that's a couple so days a week? We're all going Wednesday. Like okay. Him, me, oh, so days. once a week? Yeah. Okay. We're all there. And so far, everyone has stayed well. Yep. Okay, great. Good. I don't wear masks while we're there, so it's, well, we have stayed well. <gasps> well, of course, his main source of infectious disease is simply going to be his older siblings. Yeah. Right? That just yes. goes with life in general. Yeah. <laughs> George really likes to get in our face and love us. <laughs> oh, okay, good. So he's affectionate. He's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, has he tried to? Has Peter tried to roll over? Yes, he'll swing his leg. Okay, so he'll throw his hip. Yeah. And then get stuck on the arm. Yeah, right there. And if, but if I put my hand behind it, he'll he can complete it. Okay. So he's trying. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if he is on a blanket on the floor scooting, will his head end up a different direction than it's or in the crib even? No, not so, not so much. much. When he is rolling, like when I assist him in that, uh, then he'll get in different directions. Yeah. Okay. And are you still on your prenatal vitamins? I am on a multivitamin now. Okay. So. That has iron and vitamin D in it. Well, I was taking a probiotic that had iron, and okay. that is what was causing that's it, when I put okay. the poo. Okay. I realized it was that. So. Okay. Does it have? Do you know if it has vitamin D? Extra. I've, I've been putting. I've been thinking like three thousand. Okay. Something. Great. If, if as long as you are on that supplement, we don't have to necessarily start him on vitamin D how drops. Much, how much to nursing moms would you suggest? Well, anything over a thousand, I think, is enough for him to be getting some extra. Okay. So that that should be okay. And that's, yeah. not, and that's not too much. Uh, well, that's a lot, but actually in the winter we need it's more to boost our immune system, so I, I mean, I'm good with that. In the summer we don't do as much for them. Anymore. Right, because we're out in the sun and we yeah. get to do it naturally. But yeah, I, I'm fine with 3,000 okay. units and that assures me that he's getting some extra as well. Yeah. Does he need iron or is it me that's needing it? Do you know what? That he will absorb enough iron. Okay. Yes. Even though there's not one in my multivitamin? Um, my preference would be okay. to have some iron. I can try something different. And just see how he does yeah, with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just whatever I was taking it was a probiotic and an iron. And an iron okay. And that was too much. Yeah. 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 I, my preference would be that how you. How much iron do? I mean, just a standard multivitamin with iron for an adult okay. would, would be enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that would assure us of not having to, to start drops on him. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's take him over here. I'm going to let you sit where mom is, and if you want to make me a picture while I check out Peter, there's some fresh crayon, brand new crayons. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Look how big you've gotten. Oh, um, he must be like in six to nine months close. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, the well child checks that are so frequent in the first year of life um, is really all about growth and development. So we're following them on a growth, a growth chart. I didn't show that in the video, but we uh, electronically or old fashioned growth charts, we're following the height and weight and the head circumference, uh, showing that to the parent each time so that we can just monitor that he is following his growth curve. 
Um, and those other questions were basic developmental questions, which as you go through, if you're, if you become a pediatrician, as you go through residency, there's all kinds of lists, but you also year by year, you'll just get some in your mind. Like at, at four months old, he should be aware enough in his environment that he's tracking things, that he's turning his head if he hears a noise or if a sibling's walking, he should be trying to roll over. By six months, he should be able to do it both ways. By nine months, they should be sitting up on their own. By a year, they should be pulling up and cruising down, walking down the furniture or walking straight out in the room. Uh, by 18 months, we would expect to have at least 10 to 15 different words that they're saying. And you'll just kind of get those questions. Um, some pediatricians have a list by age that they go through. Uh, I kind of have it in my mind because I've been um, doing this for 27 years. But those are all developmental questions. I'm, I'm testing, is his brain, is his vision working, right? You'd have to have vision to track the ceiling fan or to track the siblings. Is he, you know, a sibling makes a noise or yells, does it cause him to turn? That tells me his hearing is good. And that's just a list of questions. And the reason I asked so many questions on this mom about her diet so if he was on formula, I wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have needed to go through all of that because he's getting the vitamins. But this mom was exclusively breastfeeding still. So all he was getting was breast milk. And so we need to make sure that her nutrition is good. And, and specifically in the last probably 10 years, they've kind of done some studies that, that big babies, and this one was, was a big baby, right? He's four months old, but he was already the size of a nine month old. Um, sometimes the big babies are outgrowing in iron and vitamin D, the uh, a la the amount in the breast milk. And so often we will either start them on vitamin drops, uh, vitamin D and iron drops, or we'll just make sure that the mom is still staying either on her prenatal vitamins, which have high levels of most things, or um, that we start her on some supplements. And so that, that all of those questions were, were basically because she's still a breastfeeding mom. And then we're, I'm gonna show you the well check, uh, actually, examining him. I think it's about four minutes, not very long. Um, let's see here. And let me get everything here. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's lay you down. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to lay him down this way so he could be closer to you. Okay. So his head, so he can see you in, for reassurance if he needs to. Yeah, I want you to be able to hear mom's voice. Well, that. Don't worry. I look, got yeah, it. you're proving your eye hand coordination. <laughs> yeah, let's take a listen. Oh, that's a good, strong heart. Okay, let's go over here and take a listen to your lungs. Yeah, you're trying to pull my knuckles into your mouth. Do you think they're going to taste better than yours? We're <laughs> try. Yeah, maybe. You never know. Yeah, you never know. Oh, he's got great breath. Yeah. My goodness. Woo, you're strong. Hair. Let's take a feel on your tummy over here. Yeah, over here's your spleen. Yeah, tucked under your left rib cage. It, oh, oh, can I have my finger back? <laughs> Over here's your liver. And, yeah. Oh, are you ticklish? Oh, my goodness. And let's take a big feel over those kidneys, a big deep feel. <laughs> let's check your pulses going to those busy legs. Yeah, let's check those pulses. He heard your voice. Yeah, she's right here. Over there, good. Pulses are nice and strong. Good. Both testicles are down. Let's check to make sure your hips are nice and strong. Oh, yes. I, oh, my goodness. Okay. Wow, did, were the other boys this big? I just don't remember them being this big. I think it was. Okay. I don't know. He feels the biggest. He does. He yeah. makes it for, but I can see past it. His ear, eardrum looks good. Let's look on this side. I don't know if it's a 
Yeah. yeah. He's like, look, God gave me toys that are always here, my feet. They never disappear. I never lose them. Mm -hmm. Is that fun? Yeah, there's a real small window of time of flexibility between like four and ten months that they can get their toes all the way in their mouth. Okay, well, and then they lose their flexibility and they're not able to do it anymore. So it's just a real short window. Let's see. Little brother. He, he just put his toes in his yeah. Oh, then, then they still have their flexibility. Does, he, does it look like pressure? No. Okay. No, yeah, looks good. His tongue looks because good. They couldn't shake it off for a little bit and I was like, I'm sure. Soft spot is good. Kind of rare, but I think it's a stool. Well, it's that and skin to skin with your breast. Okay. So he's just having a little sensitivity. Do you have any aquaphor at home? I do. Okay. I probably maybe just be before a nap or before bedtime put a little aquaphor. Okay. okay. Um, because the drier temperature in the winter okay. can also make the face rashes a little bit worse. Are, Peter, are you ready for your first test? Are you, are, here we go. Here we go. Are you ready? Oh my god. Oh. oh, here we go. Here we go. He's like, oh, piece of cake bringing my head and neck up together, Dr. Dutton. That's no big deal. Woo. Let's see how strong you're getting. Look at you oh, carry yeah. most of your weight. Good job. Okay, are you ready? We're going to test your trunk tone. How are those trunk muscles? Here we go. Oh, oh my gosh. You got me. There you go. Look at those legs going back. Good job. Good job. And you slammed me. And let me get everything here. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So there, there you go. The basics of a four month checkup. And, um, you know, what are the things that I'm looking for? Obviously, I, having done this for a long time, you, I can now answer questions with the mom as I'm listening to the heart and lungs and feeling the liver and spleen. Uh, for the heart, you're listening for any murmur that you might not have heard before. Uh, liver and spleen in pediatrics, the main issue is if it's bigger than normal. Uh, that can be the onset of some illnesses that they don't digest, carbohydrates, and, and uh, th so things can be backing up in the bloodstream and backing up sometimes in the spleen and liver and can be very, very serious. Uh, so it's enlarged, for the most part in pediatrics, it's enlarged um, organs that we're concerned for and that I'm looking for. Um, and then uh, the we're looking for basically when I pull them up from the table, does he have enough head and neck strength that he can bring it back? And it's not like a doll, like I said, goes, oh. Okay, so as a newborn in the first two months, the baby's head would just flop back. He wouldn't be able to pull it forward with his back and shoulders. He gains that strength, which he was able to do. And at four months, when I lifted him up, he should be able to hold his own weight. Uh, again, that's a muscle strength neurologic thing that I'm looking for. Uh, and the other thing is by four months, they, their trunk muscles, um, because they actually start pulling their, if they're on their back, they start pulling their legs and feet up a lot. You might've watched, you might've seen that. Well, that is uh, by God's design, they start pulling their legs and feet up at two, three, four months in order to strengthen the trunk muscles that they're actually going to need to sit up with. So it's isometric exercise. They're pulling their legs and feet up, and that's actually doing isometric exercise of the trunk muscles. So they should be able to plank for just a minute like he did. You saw when I lifted him up, his body went completely flat before he spit up all over me. Uh, and that was another part of pediatrics. You Thank goodness it was breast milk. Breast milk doesn't, it doesn't smell. If it was, literally, if it had been formula, I would have had to go home on my lunch break and change my clothes. Because a couple hours into dried formula, the whole room smells. So. Um, growth is important in pediatrics um, just because there are, they should just follow, uh, again, these growth charts that we look at, um, their, their weight should go up at a, at a certain rate in the first year of life, particularly. So most babies double their birth weight by the time they're six months old and triple their birth weight by the time they're a year old, which is just a more remarkable. Um, and he looked great. He looks absolutely, absolutely fabulous. He was doing you know, everything that we should see. I do remember a baby about his age in residency. Um, and this baby, the parents were like, he just seemed, he might've even been six months. He just seems really, really weak. And he wasn't kind of taking baby food very well. And he was having a lot of problems with constipation, uh, which can also be muscular. And, you know, literally when I lifted him, he must've been six months. 
because he's he should have really really been able to do when i lifted him up like i did i mean he just hung like a doll arms legs and head like there there was no tone there was absolutely and i knew that was an issue he ended up in the neurologic got a muscle biopsy and had like a, a form of muscular dystrophy just bad deal it was it was so you know, we're just looking at things both to see, are they, are they progressing in normal growth and development? Um, and are there any signs of, of something major going on is, is kind of what we're looking for on those. And let's see, I guess first section of questions. Alrighty. So now that we've reached the question section, I'm going to ask some of the highest yield questions that we've gotten so far. Um, the first one is, is rushing through an emergency with a cool head, like the situation you described in the beginning, something that you learn or do people just kind of have it in them? You know what, that is a great question. Um, I would say it's 50-50. 50% of that is because you will have done emergency room time uh, in your residency. And so you will have seen a lot of things while other people were attending at upper level residents were still in control of the situation. And so you, you, you've, have learned to, to deal with that. The other part is a personality. And, and I think you can train yourself. I would encourage you to train yourself in residency if it's not inherently your personality that just is like, all I can do is what I can do in this moment. So you, you have to be like, one of the best things that an upper level resident ever said to me when I was in my pediatric intensive care unit my second year in residency. And I mean, we saw, you know, kids that fell out of a second story window and poisonings and fire and just heart transplants, just a whole lot of tragedy uh, and a whole lot of miracles, honestly. But I remember a second year resident saying to me, never forget that for most of the children in the intensive care unit, they would have died with what brought them in, except for the care we give the natural process of the injury that happened, the natural process of the illness they had would have killed them. So anything we're doing is a positive. Anything we're doing is the right thing. And so I, I, I think you can start kind of thinking about that when you're in training in, in residency. All right, well, thanks for that insight. It's uh, something to keep in mind. Yes. Um, so the second question that we have is, is dealing with sick children on a nearly regular basis hard for you? And if so, like, how do you cope with those things? Like, like major illnesses or just routine sicknesses? I guess, um, either one, I guess, uh, do you, do you like dealing with lots, lots of common colds and flu okay. and stuff? Or yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, children get sick fast and they get well fast. So, uh, and then like my, uh, your child's cold handout that I showed you briefly talks about the fact that in the first three years of life, kids can average four to six colds a year. It can, particularly in winter, it can seem like they just got over it and here comes another one, but that's all part of what boosts their immune system. So that we, as we get older, we don't pick up things as easily because our immune system has been challenged. And so I, again, that's just like an education part that can help the parent not get so frustrated. Like here we are again. And, and, and if you could, I usually, I will say to parents a lot, I said, believe it or not in the first five, I think this is what I say in the first five years of your child's life, normally they will process like 50 different illnesses. Maybe 20 of those are colds, maybe a few stomach flus, maybe they'll get hand, foot, mouth disease, maybe a couple rounds of strep, RSV bronchiolitis. And the, the amazing thing is for the vast majority of those illnesses, their own immune system fights it off. That's why we're not sick always, right? If we didn't have a brilliant immune system, we would have the stomach flu and feel nauseous the rest of our life. If we didn't have a brilliant immune system, you would get one winter cold in November and you'd have it for four months, but you don't because we have a brilliant immune system. It's, it's amazing. And so um, I think again, probably the thing that doesn't make you go crazy when you're in that zone of December, January, and February, in Texas, at least December, January, and February, that you're just like, oh my gosh, if I see another ear infection, I'm gonna pull my hair out. If I see another RSV cough, uh, I'm gonna, 
you know, have to go get a drink or something. Uh, you get in that zone in winter, but even in the winter, even in winter illnesses, in pediatrics, you're seeing all these different age groups. So it looks different. And, and that part keeps it from making you crazy. For me, that the ages again, even during the illness zone keeps, keeps me sane. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, another really good question that we have is, does the ability to diagnose based on a hunch or limited information come with time or is it a skill that many doctors have? It comes with time. It, it comes with time. So you hopefully in medical school and residency, if you're going into, okay, let me back. If you are going in, if you're, if you are planning on going into private practice in primary care, you need to get into as many primary care practices as you can. <laughs> you need to shadow as much as you can so that you can see these frequent routine questions and, and illnesses. So, so you, it is from having seen them. Like you're like, I, I, I know this 103.5 fever concerns you mom, but I see a cluster of clear blisters on the back of his throat. And this is an Ill illness called herpangina, Coxsackie virus. Like 90% of kids have it by the time they're three years old. He's going to be miserable for five days. The medicine you give him for the fever is also going to help with the sore throat. He'll, he'll eat and drink cold, soft things better like yogurt applesauce, even put his sippy cup of water in the freezer for 20 minutes. That, that helps soothe his throat, slushies, um, those kind of things. And so once you've seen hand, foot, mouth disease multiple times, once you've seen Coxsackie with confidence, you can say to the parent, I know this is worrisome to you, but PD, I probably have said this sentence 5,000 times. Children get higher fevers with illnesses and they tolerate them better. Okay, children routinely have multiple illnesses in the first five years of life in the 102 to 105 range. And I'll look at a mom or I'll look at a dad and I'm like, if you had 102.5, you would be hallucinating. You would see spiders on the wall. Like as adults, we don't tolerate high fever as well. Um, uh, Terry, but, yes. Uh, Taylor's got another question in a second, but I wanna ask you in the emergency department, which is what I do, um, I try to see if the patient will defervesce, if their yes. fever will go away. Do you yes. use that as a clue about severity of illness? We do. In the office, if, if, uh, if a patient comes in and at the time of the visit, their fever is 102 or higher, then we go ahead and give ibuprofen or Tylenol because as you, what, what you're pointing to, Dr. Fowler, thank you for bringing that up, is they can look bad, they can look pale, the mom can be carrying them in and then the fever drops two degrees and they're toddling around, you know, eating chips um, when the fever drops back a couple of degrees. So we do, we do treat the fever, active fever in the office and that gives us time to look at them in 15 or 30 minutes later. Because, yes. you know, in the, flu, in the flu season, as you well know, I mean, people are lined up down the hall feeling like pure hell. Their temps Correct. are 103 and a half. Yes. Uh, and from an adult standpoint, they're coughing their heads off. They feel absolutely horrible. They yes. can't keep anything down. Yes. And yet their chest x-ray is normal. Their white count is right. normal. And, you know, after you've given them a liter or two of fluids, gotten their temperature down and given them some morphine, they're yeah. finally feeling better and they can actually go home because they're not seriously ill. They just have... Right. An illness that makes them feel terrible. Yeah. And that the influenza is, I find a fascinating illness. What Dr. Fowler just said, they feel horrible. They have high fever. Their, their heart is racing. Uh, the, the older kids have muscle ache, headache, miserable. Like sh the parents are like, shoot me and put me out of my misery. But the physical exam is completely normal. The throat might not even look red. I mean, influenza, it's fascinating that literally the virus inside the system can be giving you so many symptoms and making you feel so miserable. And yet the physical exam can be completely normal. Yeah. Well, changing tracks and Taylor, I'll ask the question. This is, an, this is a question that I find very interesting. What do you do with parents who don't want their kid to get some sort of medication or treatment because of something like a personal belief or a yes. faith or religion? Yes, what, okay. <laughs> what do you do about that? Yeah, that is, that's a complicated question. And, and I have had some that even like, you know, the kid had 105.4 positive influenza test and the parents aren't, are like, can't you get through the flu on your own? And so, okay, I'm going to be honest. And so sometimes I say to them, I have been practicing medicine longer than Tamiflu existed. 
Okay, so what, Tamiflu whatever came good, in, what, right? Whatever good Tamiflu does. I mean, it so, depends on if you even believe that it works. Right, right. So Tamiflu's been out maybe 20 years. I'm going to put it somewhere there. I've been practicing for 27 years. So my first five or six years of practice, I would test and I was like, wow, he's got the flu. He's going to be miserable for seven days. High fever, congestion, cough. This is his dose of ibuprofen. But so, yes, I for those patients I use, that I'm worried, like the kid looks a little bit even worse. I'm like, will you come back tomorrow? Can I see him again? Because this height makes me wonder, do we have the flu and early pneumonia? Do we have the flu, something else going on? Um, so that that's one of those that you have to trust the parents and you have to document well. <laughs> like parent told me it, to my face, they are not going to pick up this prescription. I inform them we will be checking with them in the more first thing in the morning. If anything gets worse, if his breathing pattern, if his color looks bad, they need to go to the emergency room. Are you uh, going to speak you, more about? Are yeah. you going to speak more about vaccinations, Carrie? We are. There's a whole segment. slide coming. Yeah, yeah. But I also I also want to say, Dr. Fowler, and this is where I'm very different than a lot of pediatricians, and sometimes getting conflict with them. My philosophy is that the, that the Academy of Pediatrics nor I am your child's parent, you are. And I want you to be comfortable with what I'm saying needs to be done. You're the parent. I, I do believe the parent is the ultimate authority of their child. I hope they trust me enough. I, I think my patient families overall know that I don't like to overuse medicines or antibiotics. So if I think that their child needs it, they're probably like, well, if Dr. Dutton, because she doesn't give us something if we don't need it. But I have had families, even like with strep, that were like, well, we know there's some herbal remedies. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, you know, day seven to 10 of strep, if it's not treated, it can begin attacking the heart and the kidneys. Like it, strep can become a serious thing. People used to die from it. You know, I'll try to do what I can. And I, not very many, but I have had a few families I turned into CPS. Well, you know, Carrie, uh, you know, when I was a kid, a very young person, early in my practice, Haemophilus influenza, the bacteria that you know well, uh, was a rampant problem causing meningitis due yes. to vaccinations and, and a deadly meningitis, as you yes. well know. Yes. But due to vaccinations has been virtually eliminated as Correct. a pathogen, yes. which is very interesting. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, you want to take it to, you want to go to your second section, Carrie, take it away. Okay. Shall we go on? To, okay. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you. You're welcome. So vaping, I just wanted to throw in the reminder that no matter how many years you've been in practice, new things are going to happen and you're going to have to study them and you're going to have to decide what your opinion is, how strongly I'm going to bring that up to teenagers. Um, but I had a great I, I would say this is something I missed and it was a lesson I learned. I had a 17 year old that I, this was like a month ago, very, very recently. Uh, and I was seeing him, I wanna say for jock itch. So yeast infection of the genitals. If I, it was something very basic, I had nothing. But when I listened to his heart, it was like 123 beats a minute, which is like a newborn. I mean, a, a healthy 17 year old should be 65 to 75 maybe even lower. So, you know, I listened to his heart and lungs, then did the, the reason he came in, then, you know, got his clothes back on. I listened to his heart again. I said, wow. I said, did you have a big cup of coffee this morning? And he was in on it. We let, after they turned 16, they can come into my office on their own. The parent signs a permission form. So once they drive, they can come without a parent. And uh, he said, no, no, no caffeine. And I, and I said, did you drink a soda with caffeine? Nope. I'm like, did you, uh, are you any decongestant for your allergies? Are you on Sudafed or something? He's like, no. Okay. So I never even thought about vaping because it, I'm still trying to get that in my everyday reality, believe it or not, because it's a new thing for PD, fairly new. So I'm like, I look at his chart and I'm like, wow, his normal is like 72, his heart. So it's like 50. I'm like, what in the world? So I'd look at him and I'm like, you know what? Because I, because I'm in with an adult practice, I'm like, I'm going to get an EKG and just make sure your rhythm isn't off. Like, this is just not, this isn't you. And he's like, okay, whatever, you know? So we take him over to the treatment room. 
We have the EKG in the office because half of the office is adult medicine. We get an EKG, it's fine, except for the tachycardia. So there's no, nothing else concerning. So I go back in the room and then he sheepishly says to me, uh, I did do some vaping this morning. Could that have done it? And I said, absolutely. The nicotine and the vaping is exactly why your heart rate is 125. And afterwards, I was talking to the adult, the senior adult doctor. And um, I was saying, you know, I mean, overall, right, it's got to be better than the old fashioned cigarettes with all the tar and everything that leads to lung cancer. And he kind of looks at me dismayed, like, wow, I've always thought of you as a really smart pediatrician. <laughs> and I got that look like, you're not thinking about this correctly. And he looks at me and he says, Carrie, the number one illness that kills adults in the United States is heart disease, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, early arthrosclerosis, and nicotine is connected to all of those. So we have a whole generation. No, they're not going to have as much lung cancer, but there are going to be way more early heart disease because of the nicotine and vaping. That missing it that day, like missing it. That's the one question I didn't ask him. I asked him about coffee, soda, decongestants, didn't think about asking him about vaping. And, and this is a kid with kind of a controlling household. The parents are very controlling. I've always thought, oh, he's going to try some stuff. He's going to get into drugs. Like I, at some point I knew he, there was going to be some rebellion. And honestly, I feel like my forgetting to ask that question, ending up getting an EKG, to be able to walk back in and like, dude, this is how much the vaping is stressing your heart. Your heart is beating 50 times a minute more than it's normal. You are stressing your heart. That probably kept him off vaping. Like we probably won a war because I forgot to ask and ended up getting an EKG. And uh, But anyway, the, this is just to say, you know, we have to keep up on what's going on no matter how long we've been out. Uh, and so now I, I think about it more seriously since the adult doctor reminded me nicotine's the issue. <laughs> like that, not, not all the tar and toxins and everything. Lung cancer, you know, was never a 10th percentile of what cardiac disease is. And so we have a whole generation that may not be having heart attacks when they're 50. They might be having them when they're 35 because of the nicotine and vaping. So that, you know, that's like, yeah, I hate to think about this. Uh, this is just a fun slide to show a part of pediatrics up there on your left. Uh, this mom I saw between five and 15 years old, she was my patient. Now she has a little one and is bringing him to me. And that's such a joy. And the little princess in the middle, this was a family I've seen since she was a newborn and they were moving away. So they wanted the picture of this little two-year-old had gotten Captain America clothes and pajamas and a, and a cape and the cat. And like, it was all about that after Christmas. So we got a Captain American picture and this is just a fun reminder. It's never too early to start reading. <laughs> the vaccine debate, all right. Um, first of all, I absolutely love Dr. Christo Phillips' presentation of showing us actual modern day current diphtheria, tetanus, botulism. And in fact, I, I would love to contact him and see if he could send me those videos of diphtheria and tetanus that, because it was such a reminder of how serious and horrible these illnesses are that vaccines have taken care of. Uh, I looked up just earlier today to have some perspective. In 1921, there were 206 cases, 206,000 cases every year of diphtheria. It resulted in 16,000 deaths and had a, more, a fatality rate of 25% in less than five-year-olds, diphtheria. Okay, One, something we hardly ever see anymore. Measles in 1912, three to four million infections per year. Uh, over 90% of all kids under 15 contracted measles and it would cause about 10,000 deaths and uh, up to 200,000 hospitalizations every year from pneumonia and cephalitis. Um, so when I have parents that don't want the vaccines or don't want all of the vaccines, and I, I had told Rachel, I am like on the continuum. I have families that are like, I want exactly what the, I want every vaccine the Academy of Pediatrics recommends. And I want them exactly when they recommend them, even if my four month old has to have five shots. I have other families that say, I want all of the vaccines that the Academy of Pediatrics recommends, but I never want more than two at a time. So can I get two at the checkup today and come back in a month for the other two? I have a lot that do that, a lot. A lot. But, and, and if they're willing to put up with an additional copay and another visit, the inconvenience of another visit, an additional copay to come back in a month to get the other two, I'm like, hey, that's a parent taking care of their kid. 
I'm not going to be a Nazi over having to get them all today. Now, then I have patient families that are like, we only want tetanus and MMR. That's it. We don't think the rest of these are serious illnesses. And then I probably have, I'm going to say I have 12 to 15 families that probably total 20 kids that have zero vaccines. And though a lot of them have been fired from other practices because pediatricians said, if you don't take vaccines, I cannot be your pediatrician. So I, I have the whole continuum. So what I try to tell a parent is I am pro vaccine. The reason you haven't had a second cousin who lost a baby to diphtheria is because vaccines have been successful. The reason you don't know have an uncle who's limped his whole life from polio is because polio vaccine has done its job. So the reason you're able to take this casually in some part is because the vaccines have been so successful. And so we don't see these horrible illnesses anymore. That's like, I'd almost like wish I could show those videos that Dr. Christo, like in my office, somehow to some of the families, like get them on a laptop or something and go, this is what diphtheria looks like. This is what tetanus looks like. Um, so I do, I am pro vaccines. I, I am, I am, I am for vaccines. Well, Kara, you know, as, as we discussed before your talk that uh, deaths from measles are soaring uh, Again. In, the, in the United States. You know, yes. I, I read an estimate that over 200,000 deaths have occurred uh, from measles in 2019. That's something that was in, entirely preventable. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. And God help us if something like smallpox gets out again. I mean, but even though I am pro vaccines, I, again, just like we talked about, if parents won't take the treatment, I also say the sentence, the American, of, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is not your child's parent. You are. And so you and I as partners have to do what you're comfortable with in, in the vaccine schedule for your child. And I, and so I push as hard as I can. And yet I still, this is the parent. This is the parent. And I know, you know, I, when I talk to other pediatricians at meetings, they're like, yeah, they don't want to do what you're asking, but by golly, if their child ended up with MMR pneumonia, they'd let you save his life in the, at Children's Hospital. They'd expect you to step in if their child got the consequence of not taking the vaccine. And I'm like, yep, that's exactly how that would play out. And I know Carrie, that's when I was a when I was a junior medical student, I actually saw a subacute sclerosing panencephalitis in a 15 year old girl, wow. which obviously from the measles, which, which obviously killed her. Yeah. You know, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. People just don't see this anymore. Correct. Anymore, right? Correct. So the, I, the intelligent parents will try to press hard, I guess is probably what they're thinking. Press hard back on me with um, the side effect question. Okay. And th this is how I've learned to deal with it. I look at parents and I'm like, we will never, I don't think in my lifetime, at least we will never figure out why 1 million one year olds can get the four vaccines recommended 1 million across the nation, all nationalities, why a million children can get all four of their one year old vaccines and 10,000 of them have some type of a side effect. I'm not gonna say that there aren't serious side effects from vaccines, there are. Very, very rare, but there are. And in fact, I've had one. I had a patient that got uh, two of, actually we had split it. He got two of his four one-year-old vaccines on a Thursday, I think, Thursday or Friday. On Saturday, he was in the living room and the parents felt thought he just fell off the couch while they were cooking dinner, okay? They just heard a thump and then he was whining and this and that. Uh, they went to the emergency room and the ER is like, no, he didn't break anything. And then on Sunday, he just was like wobbly. He was unstable in his gait. And the parents like, well, I don't know, maybe he got a concussion. So they, they bring him to me on Mondays, three days after the vaccines. And he wouldn't get down like his one year vaccine, you know, three days ago, he's running around the office chaos, opening all the doors and, and, you know, just chaos. And he won't get, he's afraid to get down from his mom's lap. And I'm like, put him down. And she said, 
and he he's crying. He won't crawl. He won't walk. I, I, I put a toy out for him to grab it. And his hand is wobbly trying to get to the toy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm calling children's. He ended up in three weeks in children's and they actually children's. He ended up in ICU. He ended up getting IVIG and they gave the diagnosis post immunization, acute disseminated encephalitis and myelitis. They did feel it was directly related to the vaccine. He had an abnormal MRI, so a part of his brain had been, but I am happy to tell you at three and a half years old, completely normal. No, nothing left over. The mom's like, do I have to get, they told me I needed a follow-up vaccine. I mean, follow-up MRI. And I'm like, I'm not going to press you to have to get one just because there was a a lesion they saw after all of this, because he, he is developing normally. He's a miracle. (laughs) He could have died. He was saved at Children's, but they did feel it was related to the vaccine. So there are serious side effects. I'm just saying, I have recently, this was about a year ago, this little guy was uh, in the ICU for three weeks. So, um, so you're going to have to, you're going to have to figure out as a pediatrician, how to navigate that. Um, The other pediatrician in the office with me is very exact. And it's, it rare, you know, the AAP protocol and what we should be doing. I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, laid back a little bit more casual, a little bit, let's see what the parents and um, so you, you've got to find, you just have to find your rhythm there. That's all you have to do. But, but as a pediatrician, you are going to be in the middle of the vaccine debate. You are going to be in conversations. You probably, you probably ought to, you know, have a little handout in the office that talks about how many thousands of deaths at least start with the reality of what everything was and, and, you know, start from there, but there's no right and wrong. I just want to say there's no, I mean, I can't fault the practices that say we can't see you if you won't take all the vaccines. I, I, I can't fault them. And yet I'm like, um, you're not the parent. I'm not the parent that, that that's my overlying philosophy. So um, that's kind of where I, where I land on, on those. You know, a big problem with that about the vaccines is that in any scientific thing, there is a bell curve. And while most people are over here and have absolutely nothing that occurs, there are a tiny number over here. Exactly. And occasionally you run into those. You know, the, the, you may, may recall the swine flu, the vaccine from the 70s. And there were several hundred people that got Guillain-Barre syndrome. My dad yes. was one of those. <laughs> he recovered. Wow. But, you know, these, these side effects happen, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think I think what I would encourage you as a pediatrician is to do everything you can not to be defensive. Because you you don't want you and the parent to be in conflict. Because as a pediatrician, I am trying to partner with you for your child's well-being. So I need to encourage you, I need to edify you, I need to um, support you, I need to respect you. I need to listen to you. And I, I don't want the, the parent and I, you know, at, there are times when I have said to a, a patient, I think you need to go to a different uh, office because we, we've had several encounters now and it's not the right thing for you to be here if you don't trust me. It, it's not right. That's not right. The right thing to do as a parent. If you don't trust me with your child and there's always going to be conflict, I, I think it's, it's probably time to look for somewhere else. So and, Carrie, what do you do with the, uh, with the unvaccinated kids that come in that might potentially infect other kids in your office? Is that a possibility? Well, you know, the, I guess where I go on that is if the vaccines are as great as they tell us they are and your child's had them all, everything should be okay here. I, I don't separate them out. I mean, I'm, I'm just like, okay, your kids had all the ones they're supposed to, so they shouldn't have to be afraid for, right? If the vaccines are as effective as they're supposed to be, they're not, they shouldn't have to be afraid. Yeah. And I, you know, I had mentioned with uh, Taylor and Rachel, um, you know, you, you also need to keep thinking as, as a pediatrician when, you know, hepatitis B was originally uh, studied and approved for 10 to 12 year olds as I was finishing residency. 
that's when the three shots were supposed to be given. That's what got the approval. That's got the recommendation. And then they discovered 10 to 12 year olds that are healthy aren't in the office. <laughs> so it's, you can't get the three shot series in. So they moved it down to newborns. From that point on, I wondered, are they still going to have antibodies at 20? Like we didn't make that change for a medical reason in my mind. We made it as a convenience and getting it in. And I don't know if there was lobbying from the pharmaceutical company, but I, well, now, now I have a fair amount of pre-nursing students, pre-medical students. Maybe they're taking a health class in high school and they're requiring them to get hepatitis B titers. And I, I've had like 40% titers were gone, 16, 18, 20 years old and had to get a booster. So I'm like, wow, what if what if 25% of all 20 year olds are no longer protected from hepatitis B because we moved the schedule down and we didn't ask for retesting. We didn't force the company when we made this decision. OK, probably we ought to test at 10 or 15 years out. Uh, so, you know, anyway, <laughs> that's that's um, this is just a cute picture that I call God's vaccines. <laughs> So this is my nephew's toddler. We got the goats over here. We got the dogs over here. We got the horse nearby. We got the animal water trough. And it is exposure to normal bacteria and viruses in our environment that boost and strengthen our immune system. This is how the immune system is meant to get strong from many, many different illnesses. And um, I, you know, it's humorous, but it's true. We are exposed to things all the time that are not in our own system, but our body was made to, to recognize it, to respond and, and to make, um, yeah, to make the appropriate immune reaction. Uh, Carrie, the, the little yeah. goat on the chair is too cute. Yeah, yeah, you see the little one in the oven, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is him, this is the little guy. When I got a frantic uh, fo picture on my iPhone uh, because he woke up in the morning with this rash. And I'm like, wow, did he have fever the last couple of days? How's he acting? They're like, he's acting completely fine. And I said, this is just a routine viral rash. I said, you're lucky. Usually it's two or three days of fever. And then they break out with this. Enterovirus, uh, Coxsackie can give you this. And I said, a viral rash doesn't bother them at all. So these routine viral rashes, literally. And they're like, no, he doesn't act like anything. And I, I said, it'll be gone in three days. They're like, really? I said, yes, it'll be gone. Indeed, it was. Um, so, you know, there are symptoms that are very stunning and startling to parents. And, and um, as a pediatrician, when you've seen it enough, you can talk them through that on the weekend or on the phone. Does it, can you feel it? Is it flat? Does he seem bothered? Did he have fever? Um, we tell our parents over and over and over again, I, I would rather you call me at three o'clock in the morning than go to the emergency room or Google online. Because hey, Terry, have smartphones changed your life to some degree as a doctor with all the cameras? Well, I, I actually, I have to tell you that it, it is so helpful to me when a parent brings in pictures of a progression of a rash for three days. This is what it looked like three days ago. And then, yes, we didn't come in yesterday because we thought it was better. Than it. And uh, many times I literally get the answer looking at their smartphone pictures. So that, that part, because uh, in pediatric, just like pediatrics, they get higher fevers more often than adults. Kids get all kinds of rashes more often than adults. And they can even get rashes with a cold. They can get a rash like this with influenza. Um, so they, they, they're, the virus in their bloodstream um, seems to trigger rashes in a way it doesn't as we become an adult. Uh, but again, just kind of talking through things with parents, what to expect. It's probably not bothering him at all. No, I don't even think we need to give Benadryl. It's not hives. It's, um, and as you know, once you've seen it enough times, you can confidently talk the parents off the ceiling. Uh, and then it's really funny when you see them at a checkup like six months later and, and they got through one of those illnesses without you. They're like, oh, he had high fever one night and he had this weird rash. And we were like, wait, my husband and I were like, didn't this happen like six months ago? And Dr. Dutton, remember, she just told it this and that. And when, when it is, we should be worried. And they're like, he was fine. And uh, to me, that's, that's victory. <laughs> uh, as a pediatrician that likes to educate her families and uh, allow them to gain confidence, it's, it's, it's victory for a family to learn how to get through that illness the next time, perhaps without even needing us, because they've gained confidence in, in uh, take, uh, taking care of their kid. Uh, 
I wanted to just kind of end with medicine in general. Uh, there's so many changes with HMOs and now COVID and all, all kinds of stuff, but I just want you to know it's still honorable. The medical field is an honorable place to be. The exam room is, is a sacred place as far as I'm concerned. The 15 or 25 minutes I am in there, the rest of the world disappears. I do not take my phone into the exam room. I am with that parent. I am with that kid. Every question is on the board. I am completely focused. I, I, you know, a bomb could take off half of our practice in an exam room. And I probably wouldn't know, literally probably wouldn't even notice. I am there and they, and, and a connection is made and a parent understands that. Um, and a lot of medicine you're going to discover the longer you're in it. There is so much power in healing that is not mean a cure. There are things we can't fix, but I can offer you a whole lot of compassion. I, I just had a patient diagnosed with infantile seizure, spasm, infantile spasms. Uh, just your, their brain is not doing what it's supposed to, and it can lead to further brain damage if you can't get it under control. And it's, you know, just a heartbreaking situation. Actually, some children respond to medicine, but a lot don't. And to just be, to look in the eyes of a parent and go, I'm really sorry what you're going through. And I know this costs the rest of the family. This costs energy and effort from the three-year-old and from your marriage. And, and you're, you're a great mom. A, a lot of times I just go to mom and dad, you're, you're a great dad. You're so connected to your kids. If this is, I, you know, I, I really do try to encourage them a lot. I think I have this picture here. Please don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. <laughs> okay. Even when parents download things and bring you what they, they looked up last night and thought this rash was or whatever, just, just explain. Oh, these are the three viral illnesses that usually give the rash. I, I don't think he has this thing that you found. You, you know, I would just say, um, try not to be defensive. You're smart. If you're going into medical training, you're, you're smart. Learn well. Think critically. What are, what's the most common thing that would, you know, just, just, and then it's okay if they, your generation, I have to say, I was thinking about this earlier today. Because of the whole Google search, this is going to be more of an issue for you guys. You are going to have more and more patient families probably not coming against you, but bringing in their own information because everyone's Googling it. So you almost have to even walk in kind of more of a sense of confidence and, and more of a um, choice not to get defensive. Just like, okay, people can get all kinds of information and this is what they brought me. So now I'm going to explain my understanding of the immune system, my understanding of this and that, and then we'll, you know, we're, we'll see where we're at. Um, but yeah. The, so let me Carrie, just tell you, you think, Google search is not the same as your medical training. You right. understand you, the processes. Do you think that you're reading and studying more than you did when you were younger? I well, know I, I can am. tell you, I, I feel like I, I got a, all the time. I feel like I got a second degree with COVID. I, I've watched, you know, I don't know if you know, uh, what is it? Dr. Bean, Saeed Mobin, that just does the whole hist histology of uh, the virus and the replication and the different medications that might be, I'm like, wow. Uh, so having to study the coronavirus and try to figure things out. And thankfully it, it's not as much of an issue in pediatrics. Wow. feel so grateful for that. Can I tell you? Um, but yeah, I've had to, you know, I, I do think that you have to decide that you want to keep learning the, the longer you're out. Like one of my partners um, he, I think he's 45 and he's like, oh, I don't think, I don't even know if I would keep getting board certified after I turn 50. And I'm like, okay, that's not helpful. <laughs> I want some motivation. I want you to tell me to keep going. Uh, as I just finished my whatever cycle, I'm 56 and I just finished my five year thing. It starts again. And, um, but I do think that you need to keep up new medicines, new treatments, new understanding of what's going on. And again, um, you, you, you cannot understand at where you are, where you'll be 10 or 15 years from now, how much a part of the patient family you are, particularly in primary care. The families really, you're a part of their family. That's how they think about you. That's how they talk to, about you to their neighbor and their family. It really matters to them. And, and uh, it's, it's just a, a, a special connection. Medicine is a special, I was, I was laughingly thinking about that. You know, if, 
if you were in anything except medicine and you did the physical exam on somebody, you would be arrested. If I put my hand in, and mashed down on your spleen and liver and checked your hips and told you to take your clothes off and like you would be arrested, right? That's so, that's so funny. So Carrie, wait a minute. You're telling these thousand kids that are listening to you live right now that it's actually okay to let down a little bit of your guard and get somewhat close to your patients and let Absolutely. them love you. And Absolutely. You love them. Yeah. And I, mean, I, these, I actually, are all, these are all, these are all budding scientists here. These are scientific yes. snobs. Yeah. You mean it's okay for them to get close to their patients? Well, I want to, I, I don't know if I can make this make sense, but I know Dr. Fowler and the other physicians understand by emotionally connecting to your families, patient families, kids, or on the adult side, you are more likely to notice subtle concerning symptoms in your patients. If you're emotionally connected, you're, I'm looking at a little three-year-old and I'm thinking, you know, I have seen him before with high fever and he just hasn't looked this bad. Maybe I need to get a CBC or on the adult side, the, you know, the adult doctors, as we all talk throughout the day, we'll just say, you know, just something was off. I was like, you know, that his color looks different to me or whatever. And, and so the emotional connection, not only does it add energy in your day, you know, there, I mean, sometimes with my two year well checks, the mom has practiced one of his first two word phrases is Dr. Dutton. So they sit down and I walk in and mom's like, okay, okay, okay. Like what, what we practice there. And then the da, 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 da. Mom's like, yes, Dr. Dutton. <laughs> you know, it's, so it's just sweet, you know? And, and uh, yes, you need to emotionally connect to your families because that, and your patients, because that can energize you through the day. Yeah. I, be, I believe we were meant to be connected. Yeah. And it, it will expand PD. It'll expand medicine for you. We've been uh, saying for the say last. Uh, of, oh, so I'm, I'm going to skip the triplets. Oh, go ahead. I, I was no. going to say it. It took me a little while to get um, comfortable with that idea. It doesn't have to come very naturally in your early years of training. It took a few gray hairs for me to let down my guard a little bit, especially when I had my own kiddo had grown through some personal experiences and uh, then I was more and more comfortable. So it's not a, it's not very natural for, for a lot of people and that's okay. Uh, if you can do it now, it might come to you later, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, that's a, such a great point. In the first three or four years of practice, I think what you're doing is trying to not miss anything serious. Like, like your goal is not to miss any serious diagnosis. And that, that is not a place that allows you to relax. But as Dr. Salazar was saying, as you have seen many of these illnesses and as you, as you, at some point you get to sit back and rest in the training that you underwent and the patients that you've seen. You, you, that at some point you get to rest in that and you don't have to keep in high gear over all of that. So, yeah, I, I know this is gonna sound funny and that's okay. And I probably should have asked permission beforehand, but. I just want to bless the next generation of healthcare providers. Can, can I just speak a blessing over them? Amen. That's what this cue the confetti is for. I, so next generation pre-health providers, I tell you, you can do this. I think I tell you, you're smarter than you think. I release courage and confidence and boldness into you. I tell you who you are matters. Thousands of patient visits are gonna be impacted if you hold on to your heart and your passions and your gifts through your medical training. Your brain is brilliant. I ask God to increase your neurotransmitters, your comprehension and your recall, your medical training. I say that your heart matters, your emotions matter. You need to cry when you lose a patient. You need to learn when you miss a diagnosis. And you need to be okay. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I, I bless the pursuit ahead of you. I pray joy upon you. I ask that you would be fascinated and intrigued through medical training and hold on to the glory of what you're in. And I am so excited to watch what your next generation discovers. Next generation healthcare provider, you're going to cure things we didn't. You're going to figure out things we didn't. You're going to be brilliant in ways that we weren't. And I, I bless you to believe that 
And I just ask grace to flow over these next four, seven, eight years of medical school and residency. I just pray a grace would be released from the time that we spent today. This is such, medicine is wonderful, honorable, valuable, and so are you. And I just say, woohoo to the next generation of <laughs> providers. <laughs> But Terry, don't you think that computers are going to take it all and that we won't have to be at the bedside any longer? I mean, that, I mean, don't, do you think that the human touch is still going to be necessary? Yes. I want to say that's a lie. That do not <laughs> let programs and protocols become how you do medicine because it won't make the training worth it. What's worth four years of medical school and three to five years of residency is that my mind got trained to think through symptoms and to know what to worry about, not to punch on a computer, put in some symptoms and let it tell me, don't go down that route. Oh my gosh, be, let your mind expand and be challenged in medicine. That's the there only way it. it will stay interesting to you. That's the only you way have stay a, interesting. Yeah. Do you have enough, enough energy for maybe five minutes of questions? I, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Taylor take, Taylor, take it away. My goodness. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> All the encouragement, I guess. Um, I guess I have to turn it a little dark now. One of the most popular questions we have is about like child abuse. And so have you ever seen any children who show any signs of abuse? I have. How do you deal with that? Yeah. And yeah. I have had to turn a few families into CPS um, and, Sometimes it's uh, the, the child or the baby's not growing. So you're like, okay, are they just not getting calories? Uh, I had one family that uh, had been in a horrible car wreck, like mom had broken her hip and gosh, some risk. She was in the hospital. Dad was in the hospital, two of the three kids. And in the months afterwards, life just fell apart. And it, it turned out uh, alcoholism came into the picture with the parents and the, the kids were wandering over to neighbors to ask them for food. And somebody somehow got hold of us, an aunt or whatever, to, to say, this is what's going on. Um, and to, you know, bring in the parents and try to work that out and, and open a case and then watch them kind of get their life back together. Like an aunt uh, lived with them for a year and made sure everything. And then they got reconnected or CPS came back in and said, we think things are stable now. And so that was one that was worked through, uh, which is wonderful. Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes you see odd injuries, uh, not typical, like your shins, like kids, you know, that are active. And I was, I was climbing trees and this and that. And so, you know, I had bruises all. So the front of you is normal, but you know, you start seeing bruises on their back it's kind of hard to bruise your back. You either fall against something or get punched or, um, so you start sometimes odd injuries uh, are, are kind of a sign of something going on. And, and um, there's times when like a parent will sit the four month old on the table and then go sit down in the chair. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, no bonding has happened here. Like they've dropped their kid off. Like they went to get an oil change at the car shop or, and, sat across the room and, you know, and to have a, okay, you know, are, are you sleeping when the baby smiles? Does that bring a response in you? You know, sometimes the parent starts crying and it's like, you know, we, we need to get you some help. We need to get you some sleep. We need to like, so I would say, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of bonding and attachment because it's so important the first year of life for the brain development and the heart development of, of the child. But those are hard situations. Those are because you're having to trust a system that you're not even sure, like is, is wherever the foster family gonna be better than the family we just took them from? Like, you're not assured of that. So um, yeah, it, those, are, those are difficult situations. But where you have to come from as a pediatrician is, it doesn't matter if I offend a parent or break a relationship with this family. My job is for the kid. My job is to take care of the health and well-being of the child. That that is my job. That's my legal job. And sometimes we just have to step in and and do that. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, thanks for clarifying. Um, I know you deal with mostly younger kids, but what about like self-harm related things? Yes. Do you ever like yeah. Yeah. Well, it was interesting in the last few years as more and more of the cutting came 
to be an issue in the middle school and high school, you know, cutting the risk, but not actually trying to commit suicide. And I was glad that the psychiatrist kind of jumped on that kind of early on to say, this is attention getting, this is not suicidal. They began to kind of uh, unpack that a little bit so that we could have conversations with parents that, that with superficial cutting, that we could bring them in and talk to them and tell a parent, this is a cry for help. This is a need for attention. So we do need to figure out what is not being met in the emotional needs of your teenager or where they're isolated from friendships or where social, oh my gosh, social media has been the biggest nightmare, can I tell you, for children that are given phones too early. Your 10 and 12 year old, don't give them a phone. The danger of predators or them seeing a site is 95 times greater than that phone ever being safety to them. I tell families in my office, blame it on me. When you're yelling 11 year old said, why won't you give me a, just blame it on me. Just blame it on me. I'm, I'm willing to take that because I'm just the nightmare that the younger kids who don't know how to filter and then they've seen something they don't understand. And then all of the uh, hatred and darkness that is spewed on social media in the nine and 10 and 15 year olds, they're just, they're just stabbing each other verbally without any consequences. And, and it, it is, I, I, it's such a, it is such a concern. Gary, the it's a level of information interchange that you and I did not have. We, there just wasn't that kind of information interchange. Correct. Now it's instantaneous global in astonishing quantities. And I, I think it's relatively unpredictable, the effects, whatever it may be from the lack of mindfulness to correct. who knows. Correct, correct. And, and, and um, I would say some of my concerns are, you have a whole generation that has learned how to be entertained, satisfied, they think emotionally touched with nobody else in the room. That shouldn't be normal. I, I, the, the, the normal thing would be to have conversation with someone sitting in the same room with you, to be emotionally connected to somebody sitting in the same room, to go enjoy a, an event together. Um, and so you have a whole generation that's been kind of um, marinated that, that you can have your time taken and you can learn things and you can kind of be in relationship and not have another person in the room. It's very concerning to me. Yeah, very seems concerning. It seems I clear. Say, oh, sorry. We'll just finish your point, uh, Carrie. God, what, what a great discussion. It seems clear that personality forms early from especially familial input. Absolutely. And the, the effect on personality formation, I think, for the this upcoming information era, young generation, is impossible to predict. I, I think we just simply don't know. Uh, I, Taylor, I, agree. I agree. Taylor, please. Taylor, no, I was please. Just one or two more. Even I can speak kind of for the whole social media thing, like people my age, or I can speak for myself when I say that like comparison, like being able to see people in unattainable um, goals for beauty and bodies, like body types and things like that. Like it even anybody who compares themselves to anybody who's famous or looking at all that stuff can really be toxic to you. And yes, I can imagine what it would do to a young kid. Yes. Yes. Dr. Salazar, you were about to speak up also. Yeah. Gail, please. Oh, there we go. No, I, I, um, I didn't have any questions. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought you were about, about to say something. So the, the challenge of the challenge is that the nine-year-old thinks they should have an iPad and the 12 year old is like, everybody in middle school has a phone and, and you're just kind of like, oh my gosh, they, I tell parents now, um, your child is growing up in a predator environment. And I only had to start saying that 10 years ago. Your child is growing up in a predator environment. And starting at 12 years old with the ones that have a phone, I look at it, particularly the girls, 12, 13, 14 year old girls. And um, I, I just say to them, the purpose of your phone, hard to believe, is safety. So if you are somewhere that your parents are not, if you're at a middle school dance, if you're spending the night with a friend, somebody shows up that you didn't think was going to be there. Maybe 10 of you met at the mall. 
to walk around and somebody showed up with a gun or somebody showed up with drugs. I'm like, if you are somewhere that you are not with your parent and you don't feel right, something doesn't feel right to you. Trust that. And I, I asked the parents of the 12 to 15 year old girls to have a code word. So that this is the 12 year old checkup, 13 year old checkup, 14 year old checkup, 15 year old checkup. If your daughter never gets a headache, then the code word is headache. If she is somewhere not with you and something's going on that makes her fearful or uncertain, then she calls and says, dad, I just have a headache. Can you come get me? And that's all she has to say in front of her friends. And then when you pick her up and she gets back in the car, she can tell you what was going on. You have to get in place how, a way for your child to get out of the situation they're in because they are growing up in a predator environment. And that, so that's been new. That's in the last 10 years that that has had to come into my conversation. And the other thing, when I have teen girls that now are off to college, uh, I have a college conversation. Don't go to a party alone. Everyone that goes to the party leaves together and you do not drink anything that you did not open yourself. Sometimes the moms are like, and I'm like, you know what? As far as I can see, there's at least a 50% date rape in the 15 to 25 year old age range right now. From the counseling that I do in the office, I would say 50% of 15 to 25 year old young women, yeah, have been date raped. And, and it's just like, you know, and that's, uh, that's probably been in the last five years, I've started the, the college conversation. So you, you hate that, but that's part of, uh, that's part of our job is to, to have the hard conversations. Um, this last video, I just wanted to say, your generation has been growing up under a negative narrative. Just, you're never going to amount to anything. How are they ever going to run and be CEOs? They have, you know, a thought process of a gnat. All of this negative narrative has been, you've, you've grown up in this total fog of darkness and negative narrative that I hate. I hate that for you. It's not true. Your generation is going to be every bit as brilliant, if not more than the rest of us. So last year, 2019, I felt prompted to begin a website for no other purpose than to encourage the heart of those born after 1995. That's it. The entire purpose, speak life in G, speak life to the next generation. This, so it's about 25, 15 minute videos, uh, 15 minutes, yeah, 25 videos of me just speaking life about who you are, what you can be, don't listen to what's going on around you. Doesn't matter if the world crumbles around you. There are, there are strengths that are gonna come in the crumbling world out of your generation. Just speak, I'm just speaking life. So I just encourage you, if, if you feel beat down, if you feel insecure, if you feel hopeless, despairing, jump on and be encouraged. And I have now used an hour and 58 minutes. So I guess I need to give it back to you guys. Terry, what an astonishing presentation. This We have so many questions, but I think that, you know, you've given us two magnificent hours of your love, your life, I just went to your website. It's a beautiful thing. Y'all need to go out there and take a look at that. Yeah. Um, what a blessed thing to have someone who loves life and loves their patients so much. So, so made in a deep well of deep faith and commitment to humanity. And we are just astonished by your commitment and we're blessed by your sweetness and your kindness. And so everybody put a thank you uh, Dr. Dutton into the chat. In case you can look at chat, you see a thousand people putting <laughs> so thank you. I hope there. you're not doing this again in six months because of COVID. I hope everyone's in offices, but I would be happy <laughs> to come back and do round two and go through a hundred questions we're that you hold, got today. Not We're going to hold you to that, Carrie. Yeah, and so just, we could just we, have a question and answer, not even another presentation. Like these are all the questions that came out. Let's go so, through them. Carrie, you're a magnificent person. Thank you so much You're for your welcome. time and your love and your humanity. And Taylor, I believe you got a couple more slides. You've got to go over the uh, exam and all that. Yes, I think Rachel or um, Reagan's going to go over that. Oh, I'm sorry. Whenever you're ready. There we go. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah yes. I'm sorry. I should have had that on this whole time. <laughs> no, it's fine.
So, uh, Reagan? Uh, yes. Okay. So, this is the information for this week's quiz. The pin and password are at the bottom. Um, and whenever you take this assessment, please make sure you're taking it on a laptop or a desktop. Um, there have been some issues with students taking it on their mobile devices and not being able to receive the certificate. So make sure that you take it on a desktop. And then if you would like to join our Slack group, you can definitely do that. Just go to our FAQ document and there is a link. And then um, I also saw that somebody made a Discord. Can y'all just make sure you change the official name to something other than our program's name? And that would be great. And if you can't get into the Slack, please let us know and we will make sure to get you into the account. Carrie, um, roughly about 5,000 people see each of our presentations, a uh, thousand tonight and then about another 4,000 will watch it. Wow. Each one of them will become a medical provider and see 100,000 patients during their lifetime. That's typical for a medical provider. Wow. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion lives that you wow. have touched tonight with your grace and your wow. kindness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Everyone, welcome uh, to uh, uh, Virtual Shadowing. We will see you again next week. And on behalf of Dr. Dutton and the whole Virtual Shadowing team, we wish you a good evening. Thank you and good night.